Murderous Love Triangles A Trio of Marys Welcome to our new series focusing in depth on famous crime stories of their day. Each week we will be focusing on a crime story renowned in its time. Information is derived from historical publications. Today's episode incorporates three separate stories of women who murder others they believe to be in their way to achieving their aim of securing the man they love. The stories take place in England between 1850 and 1890. This story falls under the category Murderous Love Triangles. We hope you enjoy the show. Mary Reader. We start our trio of Marys with Mary Reader, a young girl of 20 years who had come to stay at her sister Susan and her sister's husband Elias's cottage in Cambridge. Mary had been invited to come and stay with her sister Susan as Mary had complained of feeling unwell in her two previous employments. Susan Lucas was trying to help her sister the murder. On February the 21st, 1850, Susan Lucas was seen in the morning by neighbours looking to be in good health. That evening, her sister Mary prepared the evening dinner of mess, a common dinner at the time of bread combined with liquid such as broth, milk or water. Susan tasted it and complained that it tasted of slack lime. Her husband Elias encouraged her to eat it, which she did. Twenty minutes later Susan was retching and stated, I am a dead woman. Susan's illness carried on through the night. In the morning a neighbour was fetched for some brandy for Susan. The neighbour saw Susan undressed on the floor and helped her back into bed. He sent a boy to fetch her husband, Elias, stating that Elias's wife was dying. Elias's response was that he couldn't come. He didn't have the time. The boy stated he saw Elias doing nothing at the time. By the afternoon, Susan was vomiting uncontrollably. Elias did eventually arrive and was told to go and get a doctor. He left the room immediately, and he didn't speak to his wife. By the time the doctor arrived, Susan was dead. When asked what had caused the sudden onset, both Mary and Elias stated she had been complaining of pains to the chest. About the murders Mary's sister, Susan, and the sister's husband, Elias, 25 years of age, had been married some four years before Mary came to stay with them. Elias was a farm labourer and was described as a strong, muscular-looking man about 26 years of age, and up to the time of his committing this foul and unnatural crime, bore an excellent character and was noted for his easy and cheerful disposition. Mary was twenty years old, although accounts state she was young for her age. She had been described as short and plump, and her features were even and good. The expression on the, her face bore the marks of innocence. Although stated in the calendar to be twenty, she seemed no more than sixteen. Susan had recently given birth to her fourth child. Three of the children had died. There was hearsay from a local midwife that Lucas was unhappy that the latest child seemed healthy and that he wished he had never married Susan. The newborn child later died. Another hearsay report from a neighbour, claimed that Lucas had confided 
how he wished he was not married. He said he wished to get rid of his wife, a neighbour testified in court. He said he did not like married life. An affair between Elias and Mary was started within a month of Mary arriving to stay at their cottage. The Reveal The doctor, having arrived too late to help Susan, began to examine the body. He noted that she had died with her fingers clenched tightly and her abdomen was tinged blue. He stated, These symptoms made me think the woman had died from cholera or poison. I suspected the latter. Something was said about a burial. I said I could not account for the death of the deceased and that I should not give a certificate of death to the registrar. Both Mary and Elias were asked if there was poison in the house. Both stated there was none. The doctor took with him the remainder of the loaf of bread which had been eaten in the previous night's meal, as well as a sample of Susan's vomit from the garden. A few days later he returned, removing Susan's stomach and intestines for further examination. Both Susan and Elias were again asked if there was poison in the house. This time they confirmed. A drawstring pouch with large, clearly written words of arsenic poison printed upon it was produced by Mary from its place on a shelf in the kitchen. The pouch had clearly been opened. The pouch was confiscated for further testing, but neighbours were already whispering of the probable culpability of Mary and Elias. Their case was not helped by both being talkative. Mary exclaimed to many that she had hoped no one thought she was guilty of taking her poor sister's life. She also mused out loud who seemed more guilty herself for having made the tea from which Susan died or Elias for having been the person who had obtained the arsenic. Elias was equally communicative when speaking to a customer at the farm where he worked. Reportedly, Elias said he was in great trouble about his wife and that reports stated she was poisoned and that they were going to hang him. He continued, If the girl and I will keep our tongue, they cannot hurt us. Whilst life continued as usual for Mary and Elias, the stomach and intestines were being tested for arsenic at Guy's Hospital in London. The results confirmed arsenic poisoning from large quantities administered, and both Mary and Elias were arrested. The trial took place in March 1850. The evidence against Mary and Elias was overwhelming. Their case was not helped by Elias' open gaiety and laughter in the courtroom at inappropriate times. Their poor defence in the wake of all the evidence was to suggest they would have been made to make as many incriminating remarks if they had indeed been guilty, but the jury remained convinced of their culpability, and Mary and Elias were judged guilty on March 25th, 1850. From the Westmoreland Gazette in April 1850. During her confinement in jail, Mary made several statements. She admitted her own guilt, saying that she had, by Lucas's direction, put a tablespoon of arsenic into the mess which her sister partook for supper the night before she died. She also stated that she had said to Lucas, Do you think there is any harm, Elias, in poisoning for love? He reportedly replied, No. Upon which she asked, How much arsenic would poison a person? He answered, As much as will lie on a shilling. 
Lucas denied his guilt to the last. He admitted that he ought to die for having been intimate with his wife's sister, but declared that he had no knowledge that Mary was going to poison her. The nearest approach to a confession was on being spoken to by the Reverend H. Roberts, respecting Mary's statement. He said, Well, I might have told her to do it, but if I did, it was when I was in a passion. The case was a sensation in its day, including as it did illicit love with a sister, forbidden passion, and planned murder. From the Times Never within the memory of man did so large a concourse of persons assemble to witness an execution. Long before daybreak, every street and road leading into town exhibited the appearance of a fair day. From 6 a.m. in the morning until the hour appointed for the execution at 12 noon, the streets were one living mass. At the appointed hour, having taken the sacrament, they proceeded with the slightest emotion. Strange to remark, they took not the slightest notice of each other and quite resignedly submitted themselves to the charge of the hangman. Lucas first ascended the scaffold, and on reaching the first flight of steps, paused for a moment as if startled by the immense crowds which had assembled. The female culprit walked up to the stairs tranquilly, without the least assistance. The appearance of the unhappy couple on the scaffold created a thrill of horror throughout the crowd, and as the rope was being arranged around the neck of the vacant and rather innocent-looking girl, piercing screams from all points of the mass collected rent the air. At the moment of the drop falling, a terrific rush was made for the narrow gateway leading to the road. A strong body of police were in attendance, but they were of little use in checking the rush of the multitude. The bodies having hung for an hour, they were cut down and removed to the interior of the jail. The previous last execution of a female in Cambridge took place on the 17th of March, 1780. Mary Anne Britland From the love triangle of Mary Reader, her sister Susan and her sister's husband Elias, we move on to our next murderous love triangle, the story of Mary Anne Britland. Mary Anne Britland was a 38-year-old unhappily married factory worker and barmaid living in ashton under Lyme with her husband Thomas, 44, her daughter Hannah, 19, and her young daughter Susanna. Their neighbours were Mary and Thomas Dixon, who lived across the street. Mary Ann was in love with Thomas Dixon, although investigations completely exonerated him from in any way having encouraged Mary Ann. Differing accounts state that she was having an affair with Thomas Dixon, but this remains unproven. It could be that this was a love fantasy strictly in Mary Ann's head. From the Derby Daily Telegraph, May 1886, Mysterious Deaths Considerable sensation has been aroused in ashton under Lyme by the arrest of Mrs. Mary Ann Britland on a charge of causing the death of a woman named Mary Dixon, who died suddenly a fortnight ago. Death was described to abdominal spasms, but the police had some suspicion and requested the coroner to interfere. An inquest was held and an analysis ordered of the internal organs. It is believed that the arrest had been made in consequence of the analyst's report. The interest in this case is heightened by the fact that Britland's daughter and husband 
have both died suddenly within the past two months, and it is likely that the bodies will be exhumed for examination. Mrs. Britland is known to have purchased vermin killer in Ashton, and a belief prevails in some quarters that there is a close association between these purchases of poison and the three deaths. In February 1886, Mary Ann made two trips to the chemist for the purchase of Harrison's vermin killer. Mary Ann claimed it was for mice infestation in her house. The vermin killer mixture included both arsenic and strychnine as its lethal components. Mary Ann was heard to have had indiscreet conversations about mouse powder and poisoning, including questioning to others whether such poison could be traced after death. Mary Ann's first victim was her 19-year-old daughter, Hannah, in March 1886. Hannah's death was attributed to natural causes. In actuality, she had been poisoned with the aforementioned vermin killer. Mary Ann happily pocketed the £10 insurance payout owed. In her later confession, Mary Ann stated that she had suspected that her daughter Hannah had realised her infatuation with their neighbour, Thomas Dixon. Hannah had to go. It is possible that Hannah was killed in advance of the planned murder of her father to ensure that she could not testify against her mother in the event of questions surrounding the planned death of Thomas, her husband. On May the 3rd, her husband Thomas, aged 44, was murdered, using the same vermin powder as before. His death was attributed to epilepsy. This also involved another life insurance payout. The kindly neighbours, Mary and Thomas Dixon, took in the grieving Mary Ann Britland as she recovered from the quick and unexpected deaths of her daughter and husband. On the 14th of May, Mary Dixon, the wife of Mary Ann's beloved Thomas Dixon, died leaving the path clear for Thomas to fall in love with Mary Ann. However, this rapid succession of deaths in such close proximity alerted the police and investigations ensued. All three deaths were very similar in nature and in close time proximity which aroused suspicion. From Lloyd's Weekly Newsletter, May the 30th, 1886, at Ashton Underline on Tuesday, Mary Ann Britland was apprehended on suspicion of having caused the death of a young married woman named Mary Dixon by poisoning her with vermin killer. The prisoner's husband died about three weeks ago after a brief illness, and she then went to live with Mrs. Dixon, who had just died after only seven hours' illness. It is alleged that the prisoner purchased the poison at a chemist's shop. She was brought before the magistrates on Wednesday when the chief constable stated that she was suspected of having caused the death of two other persons, her husband and her daughter, both of whom died suddenly recently. Evidence was given that the prisoner had made two purchases of vermin killer, which contained strychnine, and the chief constable said that on a future occasion he should produce evidence that strychnine was found in the stomach of Mary Dixon by the analyst. The only additional evidence was that the prisoner was staying at the house of Mr. and Mrs. Dixon from the 3rd to the 13th inst, when the latter died. The prisoner was remanded. Application is to be made to the Home Secretary for authority to exhume the bodies of the two other persons. 
the authority to exhume the bodies of her daughter Hannah and her husband Thomas was given. Lethal doses of strychnine were found in all three bodies, and Mary Ann was to jail. At trial, Mary Ann's defence was that she could not have done it as there was an absence of motive. She continued that the small insurance payouts were not worth the deaths of her daughter and her husband. The prosecution's case was that Mary Ann's primary motive was an obsessive infatuation with Thomas Dixon, requiring her to murder all those in her path to obtain Thomas Dixon. The evidence against her was too damning to ignore. She had purchased vermin killer containing strychnine in enough quantities to kill all three victims. Strychnine had been found in all three victims. All three had died in a similar way. Most damning of all, there was no mice infestation in her house. Additionally, there had been the conversations she had had with others asking about the traceability of mouse poison. From the Guardian, July the 28th, 1886. A factory operative, Mary Ann Britland, was found guilty at the Manchester Assizes on Monday of the murder of three persons, her husband, daughter and neighbour, by poisoning at ashton under -Line. It was shown that she had purchased the poison, had obtained the insurance money on the death of each of her victims, and had taken up her abode with the husband of her neighbour. From the Echo, August the 9th, 1886. Execution of a woman. The woman, Mary Ann Britland, was executed this morning in Strange Ways Jail for the murder of a woman named Dixon at Ashton under Line in May last. She was also charged with the murder of her husband in the same way by poisoning him with vermin killer. She is reported to have made a full confession of her guilt of the first crime, and when asked by some relatives who visited her on Saturday whether she had done away with her husband and daughter, she hung down her head and did not deny it. During last night, the convict who had listened to the ministrations of the prison chaplain with gratitude was greatly excited, and at midnight she was heard singing snatches of hymns. This morning, when offered refreshment, she was unable to take it. She went to the scaffold supported by two female warders, and the executioner, Berry of Bradford, lost no time in fixing the rope and arranging the other preliminaries. The scene, as the procession moved to the scaffold, was very painful. The voice of the chaplain, as he read the usual prayers, was drowned by the screams of the woman. O oh Lord, have mercy. O oh Lord, forgive me, she piteously cried out. But when once on the scaffold, the necessary details were at once completed, and when the drop fell, the woman appeared to die instantly. A drop of seven feet was allowed. Mary Ann Britland became the first woman to be executed at Manchester's Strangeway Prison. Mary Piercy, a.k.a. Wheeler Our last story in our trio of Marys focuses on the infamous love triangle of Mary Wheeler, also known as Mary Piercy. The Crime in Brief On the 24th of October 1890, a corpse of a young woman with the head nearly severed from the body was found by a policeman in Hampstead. The head was wrapped in a cardigan. A blood-soaked pram was found near the body. The body showed considerable bruising, indicating that the dead woman had fought hard to defend herself. The next day, the body of an 18-month-old baby 
was discovered a mile away from the original dead body of Phoebe Hogg. It was confirmed as the body of 18-month-old Phoebe Hanslope Hogg. Death of the baby had been through suffocation. It was conjectured that the baby had suffocated in the pram when the battered body of its dead mother had been placed on top of it in the pram, thereby suffocating the baby through the weight of its dead mother on top of it. The head of the mother had been severed from the body during life. Who was Mary Piercy, also known as Mary Wheeler? Mary was born Mary Eleanor Wheeler in 1866. Mary took on the name of Mary Piercy from a carpenter with whom she moved in with for a short time, John Charles Piercy. John left her because of her infidelity with Frank Hogg. She kept the surname Piercy and referred to herself thereafter as Mary Piercy. Mary was described as having lovely russet hair and fine blue eyes. She was approximately five foot six inches in height. Mary did not work and apparently had no need to work. She lived in rented rooms at 2 Priory Street that were paid for by a Charles Creighton, one of her many admirers. She was simultaneously carrying on an affair with Frank Hogg. That relationship had gone on for four to five years. Mary fell hard from Mr. Frank Samuel Hogg, a furniture remover. The clincher for Mary, it was apparently that he had printed business cards. Frank had been carrying on with Phoebe Stiles at the same time as his relationship with Mary Piercy. Phoebe became pregnant with Frank's child. Regretfully for Frank, the marriage between Phoebe and Frank took place and the child was duly born and named Phoebe Hanslope Hogg. Discovery of the Bodies At 7pm October the 24th, a woman's body was discovered lying on a pavement in Crossfield Road by a man returning from work. He promptly reported it to a policeman. The woman's head was wrapped in a cardigan, which then removed, yielded the blood-stained face of Phoebe Hogg with a huge gash in her throat. The body was removed and taken to the morgue. It was found that the deceased had a fractured skull and that the throat had been cut so violently as to nearly sever the head. There were also bruises on the head and arms consistent with her having tried to defend herself. Examination of the place where the body was found indicated that the murder had taken place elsewhere. At this time, the police did not have an identity for the corpse. Later that evening, a constable on the beat discovered a heavily blood-stained pram in Hamilton Terrace, about a mile from where the woman's body was found. The following morning, the body of a small child was discovered. The 18-month-old child was found to have died from suffocation and was otherwise unmarked except for a few scratches. It was possible that little Phoebe had either been suffocated during or after the murder of her mother or alternatively been placed in the pram alive with her mother's body on top of her and that it was the weight of her mother's body that suffocated her. Frank Hogg and his sister Clara reported Phoebe missing after reading about the discovery of the woman's body in the Saturday evening paper. Frank sent his sister Clara around to Mary's to ask if she had seen Phoebe, which Mary denied. But Mary agreed to accompany Clara to the morgue to see if it was indeed Phoebe's body. Mary's behaviour at the morgue was reported to have been very strange. Having consented to go with Clara, when first shown the body, Mary reportedly said, That's not her, although Clara identified Phoebe's clothes. 
Mary did her best to try and prevent Clara identifying the body and became almost hysterical when the full extent of Phoebe's injuries became apparent. The police asked Mary and Clara to view the pram, which Clara identified as belonging to Phoebe. A neighbour of Mary's later stated that she had seen Mary pushing the pram with a large object in it on the evening of the murder. The Investigation Police arrived at Frank Hogg's flat, as he was their primary suspect. There, they found a key, the latch key to Mary Pierce's rented rooms. At Mary's rooms, police found substantial bloodstains and splatters in the kitchen, together with the bloodstained carving knife and fire poker. There were also clear signs of a struggle, with two broken windows in the kitchen. A rug showing bloodstains smelt strongly of paraffin, where an attempt had been made to clean it. Mary's behaviour became more and more bizarre during the police search. She sat at her piano, singing and whistling loudly, and attempting to explain away the bloodstains by saying that she had been killing mice, killing mice, killing mice. Detective Inspector Bannister decided to arrest Mary at this point and charged her with the murders of both mother and child. When Mary was searched, bloodstains were found on her clothes, scratches on her hands, and two wedding rings on her fingers, one of which was later identified as Phoebe Hoggs. Mary was kept in custody and appeared at a committal hearing at Marylebone Police Court on the 28th of October. Whilst in remand, Mary was alleged to have shared with one of the guides there, confirming that she had written a note and given it to a boy to take to her, inviting Mrs. Hogg to her house Friday afternoon to tea, as she would be at home on that afternoon. Mary continued, As we were having tea, Mrs. Hogg made a remark which I didn't like. One word brought up another. There, Mary stopped herself, possibly aware that she was incriminating herself. The trial. During the trial, the evidence of the neighbours hearing broken glass while Phoebe was visiting Mary with her baby, the people who lived in the other rooms of the house of 2 Priory Street, the boy who acted as the messenger for Mrs. Piercy, and the woman who said they saw Mary wheeling the pram covered in a blanket, now known to have contained the dead body of Mrs. Hogg and the baby child, all served to condemn Mary as guilty. The prosecutor told of the passionate attachment that Frank Hogg and the prisoner felt for each other based on letters retrieved from both homes, and that the relation that existed between them for five years, which commenced before Hogg's marriage to the deceased, and continuing down to the very short time before the murder took place on October the 24th. Letters from the considerable correspondence from Mary to Frank was read out showing a clear passion for him. The cardigan fan wrapped around the severed head of Phoebe Hogg was confirmed as having belonged to Mary's ex-partner, John Piercy, which he had left with her when he had moved on several years before. Mary remained impassive throughout the trial and gave no evidence. The defence questioned whether anyone of her size would have been able to carry out such a brutal killing. But with overwhelming evidence, Mary was found guilty after only 52 minutes consultation amongst the jury. Amongst the solemn stillness of the crowded court, the judge then assumed the black cap and proceeded to pass upon the prisoner the sentence of death.
He expressed his complete concurrence with the verdict and said he thought that the case to be one of many instances which had come before him of the terrible result of persons giving way to prurient and indecent lust. The judge continued that he thought the prisoner had become a person of so little moral sense that eventually she had been the instrument and willing instrument in taking away the life of a woman whose only offence toward her was that she was married to a man on whom the prisoner had set her unholy passion. Mary Piercy, a.k.a. Wheeler, was hung on the 23rd of December, 1890. It's worth noting that Mary Piercy had been brought forward as a possible Jack the Ripper candidate. What if Jack the Ripper had been a female? But this has not been given any serious attention. Frank Hogg. What of Frank Hogg, the philanderous husband of the murdered Phoebe and child and lover of the guilty Mary Piercy? Mr. Hogg accounted for the whole of his time on the 21st of October and said that when he went home at ten o'clock at night and missing his wife, he thought she had gone to Chorley Wood, where her father was very ill. When he had met Mary two days before the murder, she had asked if he had half an hour to spare as she wanted to see him. He had replied no. Was this the catalyst that had induced Mary to kill Phoebe? We will never know. Having carefully considered Hogg's account of how he spent his time on the 24th of October, counsel acquitted him of all participation in the terrible circumstances. Despite two pleading requests by Mary for Frank to visit her, he did not, and seems to have done his best to escape into obscurity. That concludes this episode of Murderous Love Triangles, featuring the stories of Mary Reader, Mary Ann Britland, and Mary Piercy. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. We upload short Victorian crime stories daily with longer Regency or Victorian crime stories uploaded weekly. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes below. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.